It's like a really Can you all see the presentation? Yes. 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 But I think there is an yes. echo. Hello? Is there an echo? No. I'm not hearing it now. No. Yeah, not now. No, I'm not hearing it. Okay, great. I hear echo though. Um, Good afternoon. I heard an echo for a moment. Did you hear an echo? Um, I did for a moment, but it's gone now, Savita. Please go ahead and start. OK, um, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Savita Bandi, staff, and we welcome you to the first Livable Places Action Committee meeting. Um, we commence the meeting right now. The time is 2 is 3.03 um, and we um, start the session and the recording is on. It is my privilege to um, invite our director who leads by example. So please um, over to director Margaret Wallace Brown. Thank you, Savita. And welcome to all of you today. I am very, very pleased to welcome you to the first meeting of the Livable Places Action Committee. This is a very exciting moment for the planning department. Um, this is the second step in a journey that we started um, about three years ago with walkable places. And um, our effort with this and your effort with this will be to um, you know, really make Houston a more livable, affordable and equitable place for all Houstonians. Um, we're glad that you are on this journey with us. The, um, I look into the audience and to see who all of you are, and it's an incredibly diverse set of people with very diverse perspectives, and that is intentional. We, um, we are lucky to have such devoted Houstonians and um, people who bring such different perspectives to this process, so thank you. I'm going to start. Off, so here's our agenda for today. Um, my directors welcome for just very briefly, and then I'm going to turn it over to the co-chairs. I'll introduce them to you in just a moment. And then we've got um, just a little bit of background we want to give you, and then we're going to dig right in because this is an action committee. You're going to start listening to, we're going to start making recommendations today. So um, let me start by going to the next slide. We don't normally do this when we start a committee process, but because we're virtual, I wanted to take a moment to kind of show you who you're going to be working with. And I've got photographs of some of our key people here. Um, again, my name is Margaret Wallace Brown. I'm the director of the Planning and Development Department, and you've been communicating through these past few days and weeks with Savita Bondi, who is the project manager on this process. She will be your primary point of, point of, first of contact um, through this. And so you'll get most of your emails from Suvita and um, she will be leading us on a lot of this work. Um, Suvita, can I ask you to mute everybody else if you don't mind? There's a lot of background noise. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, besides Suvita, there are a lot of people behind the scenes. There are running a virtual meeting actually takes as much work as running an in person meeting. And we are grateful to have a great staff. Um, to join us with on this effort. So you won't meet all of them in person today, but over the next few, um, over the next several months, you'll probably meet a lot of our team beyond Suvita and me. Um, if you go to the next slide, I do want to introduce um, the, our three, um, the leadership of the Planning and Development Department. I'm gonna, I want to introduce you to Planning's leadership team. Um, so you'd be familiar with these people as you work with them for 18 months. They provide exceptional leadership to what I believe is the best planning department in America. So Michael Kramer, who handles most of our development services activities, Jennifer Oslin, who is um, our expert in community engagement and our regional planning, and then David Fields is our chief transportation planner. Over the next 18 months, all three of these people will be um, interacting with you and providing you expertise and um, information for you to make the best decisions possible. Um, next slide, please. And then I could, I am going to hand it over to the folks who will be leading you directly. And I couldn't um, pass this moment to thank Marty Stein, who is the chair of the Planning Commission. She's with us today. She'll be with us on um, in these meetings also. I don't know that she wants to speak today, but I just want to make you aware that um, we are grateful for Marty's leadership getting us to this point and for helping us to 
um, work with the mayor's office and craft a committee that we think is so good. So, um, Barry, did you want to say something? I believe Marty was bowing out today. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So then my next step is to introduce you to your co-chairs for this committee, and I hand it off to them for the rest of the day. Uh, both of these um, professionals are members of our planning commission. They have an extremely deep knowledge in most of what we're going to be talking about over the next 18 months and will provide great leadership to this committee. Um, committee co-chair Sunny Garza and committee co-chair Lisa Clark. It's all yours. Lisa, are you there? Okay. So um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. But more importantly, we appreciate the fact that all of you are willing to show your faces on a Zoom meeting because I know I'm quite tired of them. And I want you to know I put on this shirt and tie today just for you. So. Uh, the next slide, Suvita, if you would. So um, we're going to go down the list. I get there's a bunch of us who are participating today. And uh, one of the things that we want you to do is, as you can see here, give your name, who you are representing, and share a memory of your neighborhood when you were young. So before we go there, I think I'll just call the roll. Might that be easiest, uh, Suvita? Yes. All right. Um, Lisa, have you joined us? Uh, yes, I, I'm here. OK, great. So Lisa, well, first, uh, Lisa, I'll introduce myself, and then you go, Lisa, and you introduce everyone else, shall we? Just go by the roll. As long as I have the complete list of committee members, I don't want to skip over anyone. Okay. Well, we'll I see. We'll see how we go. By the way, everyone, in case you didn't know, this is going to be very casually run, despite the fact that we have a very important job to do. So once again, I'm Sonny Garza, I'm vice chair of Houston Planning Commission. And frighteningly enough, I'm a marketing professional. I am not a builder, developer, lawyer, architect. So I like to say that I take the inside the loop view and an outside development view, um, mostly from the neighborhood perspective. So that's me. And this is why Lisa is co-chair with me. Go, please. Hi, I'm, I'm Lisa Clark and I'm a, a land developer. We build uh, residential communities outside of the city. Um, and I'm honored to serve beside Sonny. And uh, like he said, we we bounce ideas off of each other pretty well. So we're both excited to chair co-chair this committee. Um, so I guess what I'm going to do, if I miss you, please speak up at the end. And if I mispronounce a name, I'll apologize in advance. So um, I think I saw we have John Blunt, uh, the Harris County engineer, but I think I saw Lloyd sign on. So Lloyd White is probably here for John. Antoine Bryant. John is here. He is here. Okay. John, would you like to introduce yourself and say a minute? Share a sure. memory. Um, yeah, I'm John Blunt. I'm the county engineer. Uh, very interested in this. Um, you know, I'm interested in, in making neighborhoods, or at least where I grew up, where it was actually walkable, safe to walk. And you could actually walk to places, be it parks, uh, retail, houses of worship, which, you know, restaurants. Uh, and that's not what we're getting today. Um, and, and I think we're missing out on a lot. But. Thank you, John. OK, the next uh, committee yeah. member is Antoine Bryant. Antoine, are you with us? I am here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, I don't have a tie on nearly as nice as Sunny, so I do apologize in advance. Uh, I, uh, it's a pleasure to serve on a planning commission with both of you and on this com this committee here. I'm very excited to do so. Uh, I am a native New Yorker, so even though I've been in Houston now for 17 years, been in Texas for 20. Uh, I remember my youth of having a very pedestrian oriented community that also had uh, opportunities for live, work and play within walking distance. And I think there's a real opportunity to replicate some of these things here in Houston with very careful intentionality to development. So I look forward to working with our team and with the residents to be able to do so. Great. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, Steve Curry, are you with us? Hello. Hello. Am I here yet? There I am. Yes. Yep. 
So good afternoon. Uh, I'm a practicing architect here in Houston. Um, I'm a commissioner on the Houston Archaeological and Historic Commission, uh, and I lead a group called Houston Mod. We advocate for mid-century modern architectural legacy in Houston and surrounds. Um, so I'm interested in all these aspects of neighborhoods that we've talked about so far, and including and specifically walkability. Great, we're really glad to have you, Steve. Um, Mike Dishberger. Hi, I'm Mike Dishberger. I own uh, Sandcastle Homes. I am a native Houstonian. Uh, ele elementary school, I grew up in the southwest part of Houston, and I said, I was talking to someone today, my fondest memories were riding my bicycle to elementary school, which parents don't do anymore, but the streets were safe. You could, we actually played kickball, football, everything else in the street just because it was safe, so I remember that. I do represent the Greater Houston Builders Association, and I'm a native Houstonian, and I live inner city, and I build inner city uh, homes. Great, thank you, Mike. Toby Cole, are you with us today? I am, I am, thank you. Great. Uh, I am a lawyer here in town. I sit on the Houston Commission on Disabilities. Uh, I grew up in a -Leaf. Uh, shortly after graduating from Ailey Hastings, I broke my neck, and so I am a quadriplegic. Um, been in a chair for 30 years now, and I think probably my fondest memory right now is I have a 15-year-old daughter that's learning how to drive, and I take her back to Ailey, and we drive through the neighborhoods where I learned to drive. Um, and so it's meaningful to me. I, that My neighborhood where I grew up still feels like home to me, and I want it to feel like home to the people that live there now. Um, and the people that are going to live there in the future. So that's why I think this is so important. So I appreciate being involved. Great. We're glad to have you. Ron Lindsay, are you here? I am here. Uh, I'm Ron Lindsay. I've been in real estate development business for a little over 40 years and have been involved with city uh, committees and so forth for, for many years through the HREC continue today. Most of my practice is in commercial development uh, for landowners and uh, sometimes other parties and I do some of my own account as well. Do you have a fond memory of your neighborhood when you were young? I grew up in the Air Force so we live someplace different every three years. <laughs> I guess the, the fondest place I remember is I went to kindergarten outside of Paris. And there were trees everywhere, woods everywhere, and just get outside and play. And, you know, bringing trees back into the city uh, is, is something I think has multiple benefits. And hopefully that's an integral part of what we do with the little places. Great. Thank you, Ron. Gwen yeah. Guidi, are you with us? I am here. Great. Um, <laughs> I'm Gwen Gotti, and I'm representing, as a resident, Lindell Park and the near north side. And I guess my fondest memory as a child uh, was riding my bike to the park and just spending <laughs> hours playing at the park and playing sandlot baseball. Yeah. Very good. Can I ask everyone that's not speaking to mute your mics, please? We're hearing some conversations. Thank you, Gwen. Omar Isfar, are you with us? Uh, hello, yes, I am. Uh, Omar Isfar. I'm a, an attorney with uh, the law firm of Wilson, Cribs, and Bourne, formerly with the city attorney's office, where I was counsel for the planning commission and assisted in, in subcommittees like these that are very near and dear to my, um, to my professional interests and, and things that I consider very valuable ways to volunteer time that I think that collectively these sorts of efforts to make Houston a better place to live, work, develop, and and, um, and just, you know, watch this city grow in, in a very um, responsible and healthy way. So I'm looking forward to um, working with this committee any way I can. Great. I'm not going to let you skip the memory part, so share a memory with us. Um, well, I, I did grow up in Houston and uh, on, on the west side, and um, it was 
uh, not a very walkable area in, a, in, a, in and I but I do have um, very fond memories of visiting other parts of Houston that you know I, I think that I, I grew up in the far suburbs and I thought of the Montrose area is almost like um, a different city altogether and I would um, explore with my friends sort of the what we considered an urban jungle then and that I think I always had this sort of envy of different parts of Houston that had a, a dense um, richness of culture and um, visiting like record shops and things like that and um, I, I want to you know, see what we can do to encourage um, healthy, dense development in in Houston and bring that kind of experience to more parts of it. Great, thank you, Omar. Kirby Lou, are you with us? Kirby? Okay. Uh, Robert Feiderlein? Robert, if I, I probably butchered your name and I'm sorry. Close, uh, Robert Feederlein. Uh, I'm with Avenue Community Development Corporation. Uh, I'm the Senior Director of Real Estate Development for Avenue. We're a uh, nonprofit here in Houston that builds both multifamily and single family affordable housing. We also do comprehensive community development work. And then we also have a large uh, home buyer education and foreclosure prevention program. Uh, and my fondest memory, uh, I'm from a small town in the Midwest, and it was roaming all across that small town uh, with my friends on our bicycles and doing so safely for many, many years. Very good. All right, Meg, uh, Luke, and I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to say your last name, Meg, I'm going to let you say it. Sure, thank you. It's Meg Lusto. Can everybody hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, and I am the interim executive director of Row House CDC. We build and manage affordable housing in Houston's third ward. I actually moved here from New Orleans where I grew up. And um, I guess my fondest memories are just of getting home from school and being able to you know, leave the house on my bike or on foot and just go visit various friends and not have my parents worried about me. And I was just back by dinner and that was the norm. And it doesn't seem to be that way anymore. I hope we can get back to that. I think dense walkable communities are a huge part of that. Um, my career has been in historic preservation, and it's not just about pretty buildings. It's about communities that work for a variety of people and a variety of uses. And um, that's one reason I'm really glad to be on this committee. Great. Thank you, Meg. Peter Friedman. Peter. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Friedman. I represent Agape Development Ministries in the greater OST South Union area. Uh, we all we work here and live here. I also am the housing director for Agape Home CDC. We do affordable housing um, specifically in this area. Uh, we're hoping to, to kind of work with this committee to, to really fine tune how we're building and uh, making a difference in the best we can. Uh, for my history, my memory here, uh, I grew up in the Washington DC area uh, in Virginia about 20 miles outside of DC and back then we actually used to have horses and it wasn't as de densely populated and uh, I always uh, get a get a kick out of it and uh, smile when I see people riding horses up Cullen towards uh, McGregor Park here in Houston um, it just it reminds me of my childhood that's great you you grew up close to my uh, hometown of Williamsburg Virginia it's a great place to grow up Okay, I know I'm going to butcher your name, so I'm just going to say um, you Heine Mahmoud, please correct me. <laughs> uh, my name is Yuhaina Mahmoud. You did very okay. well. Um, I represent Metro. Um, and I'm a planner in transportation. I am uh, currently also the chair of the bike pit uh, subcommittee of HDAC and I represent Metro and the city of Houston um, Bicycle Advisory Committee. I grew up in Bogota, Colombia, and uh, went in a, some apartment complex that was uh, sort of at the corner of, of two major freeways. Uh, one of my friends' memories is when I was able to get out of the apartments um, 
there is a park in the middle and we could still bike in there. But uh, when I was um, old enough, probably around nine, they closed the freeway for the Ciclovia and I was able to ride my bike uh, on the freeway. Uh, and so that's one of my fondest memories. Um, I've worked with affordable housing um, before when I was in Austin as a project manager. Um, and so I'm very passionate about affordable housing. Um, and so I'm very glad and honored to be serving this committee. Thank you. Wonderful, We're glad to have you. Kathy Payton. Hi everybody, it's Kathy Payton. I am the CEO of Fifth Ward Community Redevelopment Corporation and Vice Chair of TERS 18. Uh, glad to be here. My fondest memory is growing up in as a fourth generation Houstonian in North Houston and the keen and the strong sense of family that we exhibited on our street. We could eat at everybody's house, cook at everybody's house and had the best sleepovers ever. Wonderful. Megan Siegler. Hi, I'm Megan Sigler. I um, currently serve on the Houston Planning Commission. Um, I also work for a home builder developer. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. And I'd say my fondest memory, like most of yours, was just the feeling of freedom, being able to ride, bikes, walk. Um, there were six people in my family growing up, and we had one car, and I thought that was completely normal. I have five people now under my roof and we have three cars and are looking at the fourth. Um, and it's not because we want the cars. It's just because of the way we live. And I'll blame Houston a little bit for that too. All right, well, thank you, Megan. Dr. Sherry Smith. I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, hello, my name is Cherie Smith. Um, I am in the urban planning department at Texas Southern University. I'm an associate professor as well as the interim department chair. My fondest memory, I will say that it's fond in retrospect. Um, I'm from Kansas City, and like everyone else, I remember riding my bike and walking to school and, and everybody knowing where I was. And that wasn't as much fun when you were small because there would be phone calls well ahead of time. So by the time you got home, your parents <laughs> already knew what had happened, what you did, and knew, and knew the true version of the story, um, even though they would let me go ahead and finish my version before I got in trouble. But in retrospect, it was great, because that means everybody knew you know, where the children were. Um, and unfortunately, they knew what we were doing. But it was in retrospect, it was a, it's a great memory. I think you, you sound like you were in my childhood as well. That, <laughs> I think that's kind of a common theme. I think everyone was raised by a village mainly. Uh, and we appreciate you joining us today. Juan Sorto. Juan, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Juan Sorto. I'm the Super Neighborhood Alliance uh, president and a PhD candidate at Texas Southern University. Um, fondest memory I have of my childhood, where well, I actually have to be back home, uh, or my childhood home of El Salvador, and uh, what draw drew my family to uh, relocate to Houston was that life that we experienced back home, which Houston has a reminisce of um, urban versus um, uh, farm, you know, uh, so. I, 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 I reside here in the Northeast Houston and any given day you can see horses going along my neighborhood and that's the kind of uh, feeling that I don't really see any other major city in the United States having. So um, childhood very much in the farm area. Houston still has some of those left. If you search long enough, you'll find horses uh, along your neighborhood. So that's what I have. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, Bobby Tyson. Bobby, are you with us? OK, if you're here and I can't hear you, um, we'll get come back to you. Louis Guajardo. Louis, I'm sorry in advance. Please introduce yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, Luis Guajardo. I'm an urban planning researcher with the Kinder Institute for Urban Research. Uh, I also sit on the board of Blueprint Houston and I'm the director elect for the American Planning Association's Houston section. Uh, and really excited to be here and support the committee's objectives um, for more diverse infill and uh, affordable housing development. Uh, a childhood memory of mine is so I grew up in I spent most of my childhood in the Rio Grande Valley, which is right on the border with Mexico and spent a lot of time in Mexico. But I I was born in Houston and do have some memories of my very young childhood of Houston. And I lived uh, in Jacinto City. Uh, we lived in a neighborhood that was tucked away between Hunting Bayou and an easement trail. And so it was really or not. A, there was no trail. There was an easement corridor uh, and it was it's really interesting to see a lot of the development around both uh, both our Bayou network and the easements now. But as a kid, um, a lot of the kids in the neighborhood and I would take our bikes and we would play in both the wooded areas of the Bayou uh, and also in the easement um, corridor. And it's it's really fun to see that as a part of this, uh, the infrastructure of the city now, which makes me um, really proud to be a Houstonian. Great. Thank you, Luis. I appreciate that. Uh, Curtis Davis. Curtis, are you with Hi, us? Good afternoon. We go. yes, good, afternoon. good afternoon. Good afternoon. So happy to be here. Um, I'm an, a retired architect and an active urban planner. Um, I've been back in Houston for 11 years now. I went to graduate school here, well, undergraduate school here, um, and um, spent most of my professional career in Boston practicing architecture urban planning, transportation planning, real estate development, and um, came here from DC uh, doing museum design and um, management construction of that. And my fondest memory, oh, I'm also uh, representing the Houston Housing Collaborative and in the Third Ward, the Northern Third Ward Neighborhood Improvement Project. Um, my fondest memory as a child, um, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and I lived in a neighborhood called Springfield, which was segregated, and it was physically divided by what was similar to something called a bayou here. It was Hogan's Creek, which is a park. And on two sides of that park were two public pools, above ground pools. They were identical, one black, one white. And we could see each other, the kids, and we'd occasionally have games in the park in our, in our kind of our planned DMZ. Um, and but we got along really well. It was an interesting neighborhood because the black kids and the white kids um, kind of were very aware of the segregation. But personally, we tended to get along. Even our parents and our public uh, infrastructure didn't get along so well. And it just taught me a lot about the power of city planning and what it can and can't do, and how people can um, bring communities together. So very I'm good. looking forward to this group. Thank you. Zion Escobar. Hi, everyone. My name is Zion Escobar. Some of you may know me under my uh, maiden name, last name Francis. Um, I am a civil engineer by trade. Uh, I am currently the executive director of the Houston Freedman's Town Conservancy, which serves to protect and preserve the historic uh, legacy of Freedman's Town and Fourth Ward. And so, as you may know, uh, Fourth Ward uh, is stands at the cross-section and intersection of all the issues we plan to discuss in uh, this committee. So I am thrilled to be here as a representative of that community in regards to equity, affordable housing, infrastructure, walkable, um, just walkable spaces, uh, transit issues, um, historic preservation specifically. So uh, I look forward to engaging with you all and learning from you all and taking that information and that knowledge uh, back to the community and hopefully getting some assistance from you all individually and as a group to help uh, Freedman's Town get on its best foot going forward. We have a lot in store and I look forward to sharing a lot of that with you in the coming weeks. Great. I can't let you get away without a childhood memory. I knew it was coming. I took a, I took a breath. <laughs> so um, although I was born in Beaumont, Texas, which obviously is not too far away and, it, and, and Beaumont has always had that um, kind of 
portions that are under invested. And, and so it, it kept that sense of community in a way. Um, it was never walkable. I was born, I was raised between Beaumont and Manhattan, New York. And so you, you just see the dichotomy of how one can live as a child, as a teenager and as an adult. And um, I think the walkability is the, the thing that impressed me most about um, New York and their sense of cultural um, integration with their walking spaces and what happens on uh, that space that's at the, the human scale. And so um, I look forward to incorporating some of those visions of what you know, a, a community can look and feel like in an urban space and still being historic. And um, so my visions of, uh, of New York are, are yeah, are, are positive. And I hope Freedmanstown can have some of that special cultural walkable vibe. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, committing time. Um, Dustin O'Neill. Hi, Lisa. You did a great job on the name. You didn't mess it up at all. I know. It's like I knew that name. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dustin O'Neill. I'm president of Costello Inc. Engineering. I'm here today representing ACEC Houston, American Council of Engineering Consultants. We're a local group of civil engineers, and of course, we're a, a big part of all of the infrastructure involved with new development and redevelopment through, in, throughout the Houston area. Um, my story is, is a happy one, though it's not all that interesting compared to everybody else's. I grew up in Bryan, Texas, and I just remember uh, I had a neighborhood with lots of green space, totally undeveloped creeks. Uh, we would disappear in the morning and our parents would figure out where we were the next day. Um, so uh, different times, but certainly, certainly uh, love the ability to be out in nature while still in your neighborhood. Absolutely. Thank you, Dustin. OK, um, Sandy Stevens. Hi, I'm uh, I'm here representing the Museum Park neighborhood. You may be familiar with it, maybe not. It's located between Midtown and the Medical Center, and it's this little hidden gem that has seen a great deal of development over the last several years. I've been a resident there for the last 15 years, and in that time period, we've seen lots of changes. And uh, it, it does retain some of the tree-lined streets that are so important to our uh, physical and emotional health when we're outdoors, and it's uh, something that we hope to retain over the coming years. I think everyone has come to recognize just how important green space is to us uh, as human beings, especially in this particular time. Um, so I'm really uh, looking forward to being a part of this committee and, uh, you know, having uh, a chance to see what's in store uh, and what how it will affect us in the coming years. So um, I appreciate being on the committee. Um, hmm, childhood memories. I grew up in Lake Jackson, Texas, which is south of Houston. Uh, Houston was where we always did our shopping. Uh, but um, it was full of trees. It was carved out of what had once been a swamp. And, um, uh, but it was lovely and sort of mid-century modern in the design of the streets and of many of the homes there. And we, like many of you, biked everywhere. Uh, there were uh, remaining areas at that point in time where we could still uh, wander through the woods, um, not so much anymore. I think it's all completely developed, but it was a lovely time when uh, life seemed a great deal uh, more uh, calm than it does today. So thank you very much. And as, as I said, I really look forward to being a part of this. Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate that. Um, Fernando Samara. Uh, I'm just going to say Fernando and you can introduce yourself. Fernando, are you with us today? Hello. Hello. No, it's Fernando Zamaripa. You just got to break it down. Z Zamaripa. Okay, uh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, I represent FZ Properties. I'm a real estate developer. I do multifamily real estate development. Um, and Fonda's memory is getting on the Metro bus from the north side of Houston and going all the way to Galleria. Love to just uh, explore and just take a look at the neighborhoods while going by. Very good. Thank you. 
Okay, did I miss any other committee members that are with us today? Okay, very good. Well, I would like to um, introduce David Robinson, City Council Member. David, are you with us? Commissioner, I am. I'm glad to be here. How well, welcome. You? Very good. I thought you might want to just say hello and um, say a few words. Well, I'd, I'd love to say hello. And uh, so far, it's fun to hear these stories. Um, having spent a, a good part of my childhood in Houston, I've got um, stories uh, for being with my cousins and usually involved in, from my memory as a young child, uh, palm trees and a swimming pool and just feelings of uh, warmth, uh, that warmth of this community that's attracted me for the rest of my life. But the, <laughs> uh, let me say the warmest childhood memory that I have from growing up where I did in Western Massachusetts was in the middle of the winter um, congregating in the community where we grew up uh, on the pond with skates on our feet um, freezing and uh, skating around. It was um, a little pond in, in a western New England town. It connected to a river. That river passed by where my, my family lived and my brother and I used to be able to go out in the backyard and walk down the hill to the river and on the lucky years we'd skate down to the pond and that would be the place of congregation so you know where i live here in montrose i think of that a little bit as uh the walkable places that we love along westheimer you know not so much skates on our feet but uh, places that you can walk and get to immediately in your community so i'm i'm loving this and hearing the stories of uh, of my friends on this committee so thank you for all you're doing well, thank you and thank you for joining us today. We appreciate that. And thank you Thanks, guys Scott. for all of your wonderful stories. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the council member. I was sure he was going to say that his fondest youthful memory was he and I serving on planning commission together. <laughs> that that was, was decades that. ago. I'm a little disappointed, David. <laughs> Commissioner Garza, back in the day was was that the 19th or the 20th century? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I, no, I'm not so sure anymore. But thank you I for was being gonna here. Say, I was going to say we did ask for youthful, so. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. Thank you. OK, so just a couple of uh, speaker rules as we start the meeting up. Um, when you're not speaking, keep your speaker on mute. If you are dialing in, you can do that by dialing star six. You can also unmute with the star six. And then when you want to request to speak, uh, you have a chat room. Just go in there and uh, send us a quick note. And I'm going to try to keep up with the chats. If I if I miss you, please feel free to reach out again, and staff will will make me stop and, and recognize you. So I'm going to pay attention to it, and I hope I don't miss anyone. Um, so you'll wait to be recognized by either me or my co-chair, Sunny. And when you do speak, you'll state your full name and speak clearly because the meeting is recorded. And then all public comments, we're going to reserve that until the end. So I think I did all of the easy and fun stuff. And now Mr. Garza gets to do the rest. All right. No, I, I, I thank you very much, Lisa. I would I would not say that was the easiest part or the most fun part. <laughs> I did that on purpose when we made assignment. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I want to remind everyone of what our role is here. And the most important thing here is you remember we are an action committee and our goal here is to get the research that other groups have done and make it real, put it into place. And so our goal first and foremost is to have an open table of discussion and for us all to engage in a discussion and use your, your background and your perspective. And you can see what a varied group that we have and that is on purpose, that is not by mistake. We've got developers, engineers, lawyers, architects, uh, professors, um, every group here, as well as the neighborhoods representing themselves as super neighborhoods and smaller neighborhoods, it's very important that all the stakeholders get a chance to speak here. The other thing is we want to make sure that you think beyond your neighborhood. We need to, we need to think about this, the city as a whole, but more importantly, think about the city as it moves forward. We're talking about the next 20 years here. Uh, Commissioner Clark can tell you that very, very often we have helped pass um, uh, ordinances that come back within three years and suddenly are not working any longer. So we're going to be addressing some of those issues today as well. And again, we will be looking for a compromise and consensus. Again, 
since ordinances are written with a broad brush stroke, it's really important to make this as, as clean and as large as possible, knowing that there are opportunities like variances for people who come in who are stepping slightly outside the lines to come back in and get some respite. Um, and again, we want to get these ideas, we want to think outside the box, and we want to think about walkability, affordability, and equity as we move forward. So I'm so glad that so many of you uh, here are in workforce housing. That is a real need in the city, and we don't want to turn into, I don't know, one of those cities like Lake Tahoe where um, you can't live in town. You have to live out of town. And we want to bring back the opportunity that so many of you discussed in your memories today about how you could live in your neighborhood, play with your friends, go to the corner grocery, go to the local park, and all in safety. And we want to help bring that back to our city. Um, Commissioner Carso, can yes, I interrupt you for yourself. one second? You know, I love to interrupt you. Of course, please. Um, I just want to take a second to thank council member Sally Alcorn. Uh, I just found out on chat that she's with us, so I did want to thank her for listening in and um, wanted to introduce her as being a member here that joined us. Council member, do you need, do, would you like to address this? No, group? thank you. I literally just wrote in the chat, don't interrupt the flow. He's going, so I'm just- I know, but I really like to do it, and, uh, so I had to do carry it. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, uh, council member. We appreciate it. And lastly, the most important thing here is for, we. you are here specifically for your point of view. We want to hear it. We want to know what your thoughts are, how the neighborhoods would react, how development would react. We need to know all of those things as we move forward. And um, we try and work towards implementing changes to city code and ordinances. So as I said at the very beginning, and, and uh, Commissioner Clark agrees with me, our duty here is to implement. We're not trying to come up with new ideas. We're gonna get the research. We're open to new ideas, of course, but we're, we're gonna be looking at the research that's already been done and looking to see how we can implement that today. So with that, uh, I will thank you for your service to this committee and your love of our city, because without it, you wouldn't be here. And I will now turn things back over to Subita Bundy. Ms. Bundy. Thank you, Chair Garza. Um, my name is Subita Bandy, and it is an honor to be here with you working on this project. I'm pleased knowing all the different stories and the contributions you have made for Houston. Um, just a quick information about the upcoming meeting dates. I request all of you to make a note of these dates. You will um, shortly after the complete of this meeting, you'll receive invites for these meetings. The meetings for 2021 will be um, formulated in few months and we will share that information with you. Um, and the contacts and resources for the, the project. If you would like to send emails or ask questions, the email address is livableplaces at houstontx.gov. And the phone numbers to call if you have any questions is 832-393-6600. You can contact me. My name is Savita Bandy, but also you can reach um, Jennifer Oslin and uh, Lynn Henson if you have any questions. The websites are listed, and I request everyone to go to letstalkhouston.org and participate in the activities, um, the public engagement activities. The next item on the agenda is project overview and objectives. I would like to present a brief um, video about Houston and the credit of this video goes to um, our team who is uh, Misty Staunton, Elise Marion, Devante Maggie and Peter Wu. I think it's taking a minute to come up. Savita? Yes. As Commissioner Clark, maybe while we're waiting for that, could you uh, announce those dates verbally? Uh, it's been a request on the chat. Sure. Um, I don't know if I can go back on the slide. How about I do it in the end of the meeting? The That'll next immediate meeting is October 20th. 
Suvida, Commissioner yes. Garza. I have the date, September 22, October 20, November 17, and December 8. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, Chair Garza. I'm going to quickly go pull up the video again. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Savita, before we move forward, should we ask everyone to turn off their video? Might that help? It probably may help. All right. So again, we'll ask all of you to turn off your video at this point. And um, and again, to indulge us as we take a moment to upload the video. I know that staff has spent a lot of time working on it. I got a brief preview and it's really quite wonderful. And I think it's a really good introduction to the work that we're going to be doing here. So. Um, I'm surprised that uh, Commissioner Clark is not helping me tap dance here in front of all of you. It's a little disappointing, I must say. I thought you were doing a pretty good job by yourself. I was waiting for you to stumble a little like bit. Like to falter and stop? Yeah, this is your cue. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both for um, helping us through this. Subita, are you, you've got it now? There we go. Is here it playing for you? It is now playing, yes. yes. Thank you. I hope the sound is up there. Yes. Okay, thank you. Houston spans an area of 671 square miles and our extraterritorial jurisdiction boundary adds another five mile band around the city. Houston is a rapidly growing city with approximately 2.3 million residents and is located within one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the nation with the estimated 6.9 million residents. The region is expected to grow by 3.1 million over the next 20 years, surpassing 10 million by 2040. Projections show that most of the growth will be in Houston proper in Harris County. Mayor Sylvester Turner frequently touts our diversity as one of our city's greatest assets. People come to Houston from all over the globe. Nearly one in four residents are foreign born and over 90 languages are spoken in the city. Our various industries attract one of the youngest and most international workforces in the nation. In fact, Rice University research shows that Houston today mirrors what demographers forecast the U.S. population will look like in the future. The eight county Houston region has experienced dramatic changes in its population size and job growth over the last few decades, and these trends are expected to continue. Addressing those future needs calls for progressive and proactive planning now. Ethnic and generational shifts can also bring new values, housing, and lifestyle priorities. The single family detached housing historically preferred by individual families, may give way to a desire for more urbanized housing. Active transportation choices, such as walking and biking, have become increasingly popular, especially in urban core areas of the city. Population growth is only part of the big picture. Houston Galveston Area Council projections indicate that by 2040, the percentage of residents age 60 and older will increase by 10%. So, Housing and transportation planning must be inclusive of all ages and ranges of mobility. Like any other city, Houston's growth has brought with it challenges such as rising housing costs, displacement, unsafe roads for cycling, and many neighborhoods where homes, work, and amenities are separated by long distances. Housing affordability in Houston can be misleading when you don't factor in the cost of transportation. The dark green areas on this map show where households can budget 30% or less of their income for housing costs. Under that premise, much of Houston appears to be affordable on this map. But when you combine transportation and housing costs, the criteria for affordability increases to 45%. This map shows that most of the Houston area residents are using more than 45% of their income for housing and transportation, making it unaffordable. This mapping tool developed by Link Houston combined affordable housing with transportation options. The blue areas on the map are ideal because they are both affordable and well connected to transit. 
Availability of inexpensive land on the edges of urban development has shaped Houston's current growth more than transit availability or proximity to job centers. As Houston continues to expand further past its boundaries, sprawling development patterns become more costly for the city to maintain and to provide services. In this image of 2019 platting activity, the orange circles show that development of single-family homes outside the city limits outpaces single-family development inside the city by nearly four to one. Suburban development will continue to fit the preferences and needs of a significant percentage of residents. But the challenge for the city becomes how to encourage affordable housing and development within the city that relies less on cars and is closer to transit and job centers. We will need to address these challenges head on to enhance services for current residents, prepare for anticipated growth, and to make Houston a walkable, affordable, and equitable city in the future. Houston offers opportunity for all and celebrates its diversity of people, economy, culture, and places. Houston promotes healthy and resilient communities through smart civic investments, dynamic partnerships, education, and innovation. Houston is the place where anyone can prosper and feel at home. Thank you, that was a great video. And now that we had a glimpse of Houston and the challenges, what is the city doing about it? Let me quickly switch to the presentation again. Now that we had a glimpse of challenges in Houston, what is the city doing about it? City leadership in the past few years has taken a proactive approach to find solutions for these challenges by drafting formal plans prepared with significant public input. Plan Houston, Resilient Houston, Climate Action Plan, and many more. Mainly, I would like to mention Plan Houston, the first ever general plan adopted by City Council in 2015, established a community vision and identified goals, strategies, and actions for Houston's long-term future. And Resilient Houston, presented by Mayor Turner in 2020, is a framework for collective action with goals and actions we can take today to shape the future for next generation of Houstonians. This approach can help Houston become a much desired city. While the release of Resilient Houston marks an important milestone, greater commitment is required to implement the actions recommended. So here we are, the Planning and Development Department, committed to implement some of the actions recommended for development in Houston through Livable Places Initiative. This is the Charge of Livable Places Action Committee. The Livable Places Initiative puts our city development codes under a microscope to show that little changes can make a big impact on some of our city's most pressing issues, paving the way for more affordable housing and stronger communities across Houston, said Mayor Sylvester Turner. Drawing from the actions and community preferences recommended in Plan Houston, Resilient Houston and Climate Action Plan, Livable Places aims to protect and strengthen neighborhoods through appropriate infill development, review and amend lot size and coverage area requirements, integrate accessory dwelling units or granny flats into existing neighborhoods, promote the need for safe, secure, and affordable homes and transportation access for all Houstonians, build equitable development near transit and trails, and one-size-fits-all parking regulations. There are many more, but these are a few to name. This initiative will be led by the Planning and Development Department with support and input from the entire Houston community. 
Livable Places Action Committee comprised of industry representatives, subject matter experts, community leaders, and other agencies will help staff analyze the action steps, identify issues to be addressed with the committee's work, and provide guidance throughout the process. The Technical Advisory Group, made up of different city departments and external agencies, will provide technical expertise to staff and consultant in developing ordinance amendment proposals. The Planning Commission, who oversees the project, will consider the recommendations, listen to public input, and make recommendations to the City Council. Throughout the process, staff will present regular updates of the progress to the Planning Commission as well as the City Council Committee and seek input. The Planning Commission will forward the proposed amendments to the City Council for their action. Here is the project timeline. This project is expected to take 18 to 24 months to complete. Minor technical amendments will be addressed and forwarded to City Council in 2021 as the first phase. Topics such as parking, housing, and mobility will be studied with the help of outside consultants to identify best practices. These best practices will be used to develop ordinance amendment proposals in phase two of the project. Extensive public outreach and engagement will occur throughout. To give you a brief description on the public engagement strategy, I would like to invite Lynn Hansen. Thank you, Savita. Give you a brief Good description afternoon. on the public. Thank you, Savita, and good afternoon, co-chairs and committee members. I am Lynn Henson with the Community and Regional Planning Division of the Planning and Development Department. I just want to say a br few things briefly about our community engagement strategy. Although COVID has changed the way we operate, we are still interacting with the public. In fact, we are incorporating new tools to allow us to be able to do that. We are, we, could you back up one slide? Thank you. We are using letstalkhouston.org, which is an internet website that allows us to conduct the same type of surveys we used to do in public with people over the internet. We're able to share articles and other tools available on that website. We also have an SMS text option for those that have limited internet access. That number is 833-408-2362. And we'll have that on the screen a little later in the presentation. Now, the purpose of our community engagement strategy is basically for consensus building, going out to the community, being able to build trust with them on what the committee is working on, it's also an opportunity for us to inform and educate different stakeholders on proposed concepts. It also gives us an opportunity to test those proposed concepts. I mentioned stakeholders. We see stakeholders basically in three different buckets or categories. Uh, for example, the consumer, that's the individual or family that buys a house or may live in a multi-unit facility or building, such as apartments or condominiums, as well as commercial owners. The activities and questions we have for the consumer may be a little bit different from those that actually apply the code. For example, architects, builders, developers, and so on. As well as those that actually regulate the other city departments, other governmental agencies, as well as the surrounding jurisdictions and the Planning Commission and City Council. Just to mention a few additional tools and methods that we'll be using, we want to get information out to the public through, for example, videos. We'll be getting information back from the public with surveys and other traditional types of tools. We'll be able to collaborate um, that engagement through panel discussions, focus groups, etc. 
And we'll be able to update the public on what we're doing at what time through methods such as social media. Now this side is a repeat, so Vidit already talked about our timeline, but it's back on the screen so that we can talk about the fact that community engagement will actually span the entire committee's work. This gives an opportunity to the public to, for example, speak at the end of the meeting, as we will today, as well as speak during the public hearing portions of the adoption phase when proposed changes move to Planning Commission and on to City Council. I mentioned that we have different questions that will be slated for different stages as well as to the different stakeholders. So I want you to please keep that in mind as we move forward. So if there's anything that you want to ask the public that you want some feedback on at different stages in the process, we can possibly integrate that into our public engagement, for example, into surveys that we're asking the public. If you have any questions or comments in this regard, please contact me, Lynn Henson, or Jennifer Oslin, or Savita Bandy. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Savita. Thank you, Lynn. Um, before we get deeper into addressing the topics related to housing, mobility, etc., we would like for the committee to consider few chapter 42 technical amendments and that is the next item on the agenda. So um, you may be wondering, so what what do you mean technical amendments? Um, let me invite Araceli Rodriguez to explain and present these items and uh, she is a planner with keen eye and very thorough. So this is Araceli Rodriguez coming up for you. Thank you, Suvira. Good afternoon, co-chairs and members of the committee. My name is Araceli Rodriguez from the Planning Department. As Civita explained, we will go over a few Chapter 42 technical amendments today. So you may be wondering what technical amendments are. So technical amendments are minor modification needed to improve the function of the ordinance or to eliminate inconsistency without impacting the regulation. This amendment made the touch of one philosophy and are very limited in scope that doesn't require extensive review and already had the support from the committee leadership. This topic are um, the items shown on the screen. Is your next slide, please. So we're going to go get started with the first one. The first topic is time for submittal. The objective is to revise the ordinance language to match the Planning Commission approved meeting dates posted in our Planning Department website. In other words, the way we set up the calendar doesn't exactly match to what is written in the code. And we would like to amend the ordinance to be consistent with the long-standing policy applied during holiday schedules. Per Chapter 42 requirement, all application must be submitted 10 days before the next scheduled planning commission meeting. This requirement works very well with two weeks cycles. Application are submitted every other Monday, but in a three week cycle, which is highlighted in a green box, as per the approved submit of schedule, application are submitted 18 days prior to the next scheduled planning commission meeting, which doesn't match the ordinate requirements. Strict application of the ordinance would allow applicants to submit on the day highlighted in red on the screen, which may cause notification timeline challenges and also reduce time for plot review. Therefore, the approach of the amendment is to accommodate longer cycles. This will create regular and predictable submittal periods. It will provide um, reasonable time for staff to perform all duties. So if the committee agree with this proposed technical amendment, we would like to take this item to planning commission. So I would like to know if there are any question or comment at this time. If not, then we would like to continue with the next. 
Araceli, just a moment, please. So yeah. ladies and gentlemen, again, what we're talking about here yes. is the schedule for planning commission. And because of holidays, um, we end up having three weeks in between from submittal to the actual meeting, which again, as Araceli said, the language doesn't match. So this is nothing more than a technical change, uh, basically in language to make sure that all the, the language matches up. Lisa, anything? Well, yeah, I think that we need to understand a little bit better. What is the language going to say? Are you going to just say during a holiday cycle and then define the time frames, or how are you going to do that? We already doing it, so we're just going to uh, modify the language to match the uh, approved schedule, which is posted online. It was shown during the presentation. Um, we want to follow what is approved by Planning Commission. We have the submittal date and the planning commission date. So yes, I, and I understand that. And yeah. I understand it, but I'm you know I'm worried that others won't. So it'll just match every year. Whatever schedule we adopt, that yes. link will go right along yeah. with it. Okay, thank yes. you. Thanks for the clarification. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, any other questions? If none, um, Araceli, why don't we go ahead and move forward with the next one? Perfect. So the next topic is city planning letter. So chapter 42 requires title report to be submitted with all final plat application. But for our long-standing practice, applicants are also allowed to submit city planning letters with appropriate information instead of a title report. The problem is that the ordinance doesn't specify CPL and amend the ordinance to continue this long-standing practice of allowing the submittal of CPL. So what is a title report? A title report is a title policy that consists of many pages with information on the property being plotted, such as legal description, property owner, easement, restriction, and other relevant information that is affecting the property in question. A CPL as you see in the screen, it's a much shorter and simpler version of the title report that provides all the information needed for plotting purposes. Again, shut the easement and date restriction. So for this reason, a CPO also conforms to the requirement of chapter 42. So the approach of this amendment is to modify the definition of title report and to allow CPO to be submitted instead of a title report. If the committee agrees with this proposed technical amendment, we would like to take this item to planning commission. Are there any questions or comments at this time? I think that's a great, find a great step that we're taking. Um, the difference too between a title report is a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, so I appreciate you guys making that clarification. All right, ladies and gentlemen, any questions? Okay, Araceli, go ahead and continue if you would. OK, so the last item that we're going to be discussing today is street width in place. And the objective is to make sure that the boundary of the street width in place area in Chapter 42 is consistent with the street ordinance number 1999-1344. So in 1999, City Council adopted the street ordinance recognizing some existing right away as public street within the Fort Ward area. In 2001, City Council adopted another ordinance confirming the width of this street to be less than 50 and decided that no additional right away dedication was needed. So in Chapter 42, while referring this area, the text highlighted in orange on the screen got omitted. So the purpose of this amendment is to add this omitted language to the ordinance. This will help to prevent confusion in the future when deciding if right away dedication is needed. So the approach of this amendment is to match the street ordinance language by adding the omitted language in chapter 42. So if the committee agree with this proposed technical amendment, we would like to take this item to planning commission. Are there any question or comment at this time? So this All is right, Ron Lindsay. Gentlemen. I just want to clarify, are we you saying it only applies to the so that's this ward and not citywide? Exactly. Only the area highlighted in blue in the Fort Ward. All right, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? 
All right, so uh, good. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Commissioner Garza, I think there was a hand raised from a committee member. All right, I don't see one. Uh, go ahead and announce yourself by name, please. Uh, this is Curtis Davis. I have raised my hand on a previous question. Mr. And Davis, go ahead, please. Sure, and it was a, a, about the title report. The city um, planning letter, I think it's a great idea. Um, does it also imply that the title report does not have to be done at all? Or is it just that the city um, planning letter is submitted in lieu of that and the title report still needs to be completed? Committee member, if I may answer that question, this is Savita Bandi, staff. The city planning letter will be a simpler version and it is an option available if they want to opt and provide the city planning letter. So the proposal is only to add it to the definitions that a city planner planning letter can also be submitted in lieu of a title report. OK, thank you. So I can I can infer that this title report would not need to be done at all, need not be referenced and the city planning letter is all that you need. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, uh, anyone else? Any questions about any of the three that we're looking at today? Again, these are all technical amendments. Again, they're mostly language clarifications and simplification um, and making sure that, you know, uh, everything that is done and currently uh, in place matches one another. There are multiple places for all these things. So any other discussion before we move forward? Commissioner Garza, Gwen Guidi uh, yes. has raised her hand and then Stephen Payne. Thank you. Gwen, go right ahead. There, I'm unmuted now. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just had a, a quick question about the language in the very first one. Um, will that reference be made explicitly or just the same language be copied? Um, meaning, will the, the dates for the submittals reference the dates for the Planning Committee Commission? Oh, if I may. Is, yes, thank you. Sorry, if I may answer that question, committee member, this is Vida Bandi, staff. Okay. Um, the only change that we are proposing is instead of, instead of saying that um, the language that says the submittal date is 10 days in advance of the planning commission, instead we would like for it to be revised to say that the submittal dates and the planning commission dates are approved by the planning commission and they are available on the website. So the reference uh, will be tied to what will be approved by the planning commission during the end of the year, every year. I got you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the next individual with their hand raised was, hold on a moment. Didn't I see another board member here? Mr. Payne. Hi, this is Stephen Payne. I'm a retired lawyer who did a fair amount of real estate work in my practice. Uh, this goes back to the city planning letter. Uh, obviously, I don't have a draft in front of me. I, I don't know what it's supposed to present. Um, but I think for clarification to the public in general and the people who will be working with this system seems to me that the developers are going to have to have a title report in order to have the information which goes into the city planning letter, which gets me to the question of who in fact prepares the city planning letter and who who's it addressed to and who is it signed by? All right, um, Mr. Payne, thank you so much. Ms. Bandy, one moment, please. I, um, Mr. Payne, um, you may not have joined us at the very beginning. We're saving public comment till the very end versus on an item by item basis. So uh, if, if uh, you don't mind, I will have Ms. Bandy uh, get an answer for you, but it'll happen at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Friedman. Peter, are you there? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, on the city planning letter, I, 
uh, we've always used a title company to, to pull those for our properties. Um, so it, they have all the same information that you would have on any other title work. But uh, I wanted to ask a question on the city planning letters. Does this specific ordinance specify how long they are good for? I know I've had a couple of them expire on me. Um, I think they're, they're only good for in the current ordinance of six months. Nothing had changed, but they expired. So we had to go through the cost of getting a new one um, once they expired. If I may answer that question, this is Savita Bandi. The title, um, sorry, the city planning letters come with an effective date as identified on the screen with the date. Um, the effective date, the title report generally, uh, sorry, the city planning letter is generally accepted within one year of that date for the planning department. Um, not so often have I seen a title report with an expiry date, but if there is an expiry date, then it will not be accepted after the expiry date. Does that answer your question, sir? Is is that just a internal um, process that they you, you give it a one year or is that actually in the ordinance that the city planning letters are expired after a year? Um, the one year is not in the ordinance that has been a policy long standing policy. Some documents come with an expiry date. In that case, we will stick with the expiry date instead of the one year. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Lisa, any questions? Anything before we move I just on? I have a real quick request. Uh, yes. One of our committee members had to step away. Can we just scroll through those? Um, amendments, those technical amendments real quick. Savita, can we do um, that? Yes, actually, I want to stand corrected. Um, I just said one year. I really meant one month. The title, sorry, the city planning letter is good for one month. And if there is an expiry date, um, we will still only accept up to uh, 30 days, which is one month. Sorry about that. All right, Ms. Escobar, I see your hand raised. Did you have a question? Yes, sir, I do. Um, yes, and it's go right actually, ahead. Uh, it's about the street width item. Would you be able to scroll to that set of images and the boundary there? Um, let me do this. Okay. And while you're getting that up, I'll, I'll go ahead and maybe start describing my question to save time. Surely, go I'm, ahead. Uh, and in reading the item that we were uh, instructed to regarding section 42.123C, um, what I'm, what I'm, my understanding is, is that areas within this boundary um, are excluded um, from the requirement of dedicating additional right of way in excess of the 50 feet. Is that, is that what this is saying? That is going to remain the same. Mm -hmm. The only um amendment we are proposing is that what you see in orange boundaries is not included in chapter 42 if let's say there is a development that is going to come up along gray street mm -hmm. there will be need for dedication however in the past not having this language that these streets are excluded had led to some confusion and we wanted that to be cleared up because both the ordinance and the code have to match that's the proposal. OK, Savita, may I may I restate her question? I think her question was, are you saying within these blue streets? If a development takes place, will they be required to dedicate additional right of way? No, they will not be. And so what we are doing, um, Zion, is we are making the boundaries of this area where we do not require additional right of way more clear because right now it is ambiguous on um, the boundaries. OK, and is there language elsewhere that that wasn't in uh, this particular section that states what that same requirement is for areas that are not marked in blue? Um, because that's 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 of consequence to our community because there's um, the opportunity for others to come in just um, left or right of this area and and insist that 
will have to have this expanded uh, right away, which I'm not sure how that lines up where you have it 50 feet uh, in one area and then you cross gray and it's not 50 feet. Um, how do you intend to rectify the changes between the two? Or is that addressed somewhere else, I guess? If we want to, ex sorry. So, Savita, so this language is going to be placed where in the ordinance so that, for instance, where that requirement is, would we show the exclusion in that same area? So if someone's thinking they need to dedicate, um, they will know immediately that they don't because this is placed close to the original language of the ordinance. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's actually a correction of the original language. I think it's 42-123. Uh, Arisili, please correct me if I'm mistaken. Um, we are just adding this um, yellow portion, which got missed from Chapter 42. Okay. So it's just a correction. Okay. So it does, in fact, pretend what's on the ground today mm -hmm. without having to do no, any kind of expansion. it does not. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, anything else on our three? I think she was going to scroll through the three very quickly for yes. Mark because he stepped away. All right. So we've Is got there a specific slide we are wanting to see? No, just we need to just show the technical amendments that you presented. OK, we for presented the first three items on this list. Uh, which is time for submittal city planning letter and street width in place. And then maybe slowly go through it until you get to the next one that you're getting ready to present. OK. Before we go forward, anyone questions? Uh, um, the, uh, this is, oh, there, never mind. All right, please mute if you're on. And uh, we'll continue. Yes, and we will present the items four, five and six during the next meeting. Um, but we will continue through our presentation after I scroll all the way to the end. With the rest of the items on the agenda. Um, so if there are no other comments or questions, we will go to the next steps. The next steps are the establishment of a focus group, which is the conservation district's focus group. And uh, for that, I would like to invite Roman McClellan, who is very passionate about history and can share captivating stories. So this is Roman and over to you, Roman. OK, hi, everybody. I'm actually sitting on my front porch. Can you hear me OK? I can hear you. Y'all can we got another deluge coming down. I'm Roman McAllen, uh, co-chairs and and commission members or committee members and city council members who are here. I am Roman McAllen and, and I wanted to share my memory real quick. I remember uh, I grew up in Windsor Village off of South Main and South Coast Oak. And um, I remember climbing a large cotton tree that was probably two and a half stories tall, or at least I thought it was. And um, and the clean air that we had in Houston, and I could see all the way to, uh, all the way down, I think, to like Meyerland. There was some tall structure down that way. So I just want to say that you know I, I'm really uh, happy to be the historic preservation officer for the city of Houston, and uh, I really w I would like to see us protect um, a more diverse representation of the history of Houston. Uh, so what we plan to do with it here is to start in October and uh, with uh, this group, this focus group, and then draft the framework, uh, which I've already sort of sketched out, but we need to make sure we've got the right form of the framework to create what we're calling a conservation district at this point. And um, that's that's our goal with this with this focus group. And we want to look specifically at the needs of the different communities in Houston that would consider a conservation district, because it really is a tool that um, we can customize, or at least that's the way I see it, and that's the way it's being done. Really, across the United States, there's a, there's a resurgence of looking at new types of districts that protect our heritage, and there's a lot of talk about cultural heritage. 
we know that a lot of historic resources uh, in the more socio and economically disadvantaged areas um, have gone away and there's a lot of redevelopment and which is good and it, it, it's good that the neighborhoods are getting better but we want to be helpful and mindful of the cultural heritage and of the people who have put in decades of their lives in their homes and uh, we just want to make we want to do that and I'm looking so much forward to working with the focus group and and executing on this and I want to say thank you to everybody for for and Suvita for having me be a part of this and for Margaret for recruiting me to Houston back to Houston thank you and I uh, take any questions Yes, so uh, thank you, uh, Mr. McAllen. So this is a very exciting um, new concept. We've got lots of tools in our toolbox to do to answer a lot of challenges that neighborhoods have, but there are still others that are we don't have solutions for. And that is what this conservation district program will hope to do, where you don't have necessarily a historic district, but you've got um, a cultural group or groups of people who are put together who are having major effect on an area and want to preserve its... Um, I think the word we were using previously was ethos. What does it look like? How do we keep it this way? How do we augment that? So let me open this up to our uh, subcommittee and uh, see if there's any questions. Uh, any questions for Mr. McAllen? All right. Well, uh, Mr. I, I McAllen, see some hands up. I see some hands okay. up. Go right ahead. Who's first? Um, Omar, I believe, had his hand up first. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I um, and thank you, uh, Roman, and nice to meet you. And thank you, Margaret, for sharing that paper on conservation districts with what Dallas has accomplished. Uh, I, I guess I, my question has to do uh, basically with what uh, Sonny just said to introduce the topic for neighborhoods that are not historic and um, and perhaps you know the designation of a historic district is usually followed by or now accompanied with design guidelines that identify certain architectural features of those um, districts to be preserved. Are, is the focus on conservation districts, and, and maybe there's no answer to this, and the purpose of the committee is to zero in on it, is it going to be focused on the architectural characteristics of those neighborhoods, I mean, you know, in what way are we going to identify an ethos that can be preserved with uh, with planning tools? If it's not architecture, is it scale, size, is it building materials? Just, I'm, I'm just curious about how that will work in Houston in a manner that's different from the historic districts that we have. That's a great, great question. Um, and I think that's what the uh, focus group will be working on is to figure out what all should be uh, considered while establishing a framework for conservation districts. So um, thank you and uh, we will look into the details and that will be part of the focus group's work. All right, Mr. Davis, is your hand up? Yes, yes. In the context of the proposed working group on conservation districts. Will historic districts and cultural districts be looked at in parallel so that the distinctions for when is most appropriate to apply them can be better understood and we can communicate that more clearly to the general public? That is a great suggestion. Sorry. This is, this is Director Wallace Pratt. May I answer that? Please. Mr. Davis, I think that's an excellent question. And what the focus group will, will focus on is how does a conservation district in whatever form it ultimately takes work with um, the community that is, how does it relate to the existing historic district language? Um, and how can we structure a conservation district that more broadly interests the community that thinks they have some sense of culture or heritage. They have this, what um, Co-Chair Garza said, the ethos of this neighborhood, but that they're not quite prepared to take the full step into full-blown historic district um, designation. We all know, or many of us know, 
that um, by becoming a historic district, there are a number of regulatory steps that a neighborhood needs to go through and that there are some challenges for property owners who believe that it is too much regulation for them on their homes. And so can this conservation district idea be something that is um, targeted to a community that's not ready to become a historic district or that isn't interested in a, in a historic district? Is there something else we can do to assist neighborhoods that aren't willing to take that big step? Thank you. Um, Ms. Gladie, are you there? Did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Go and right ahead, please. I, I think you guys are kind of getting right to the point of my question, which is the focus group is basically going to define what a conservation district is. Yes. Got it. <laughs> OK, I think you explained that for a lot of people. <laughs> but yes, the idea will be we don't have one currently and we want to see what the possibilities are of putting one together so that we can help communities that the tools that are currently in place don't really have the effect that they need. And as uh, as um, Director Wallace Brown said, they're not quite ready to go, if ever, to the, to, the, to the strictures put on them by historical district, but this might be a good halfway measure, even a starting point to get them on their way. So we're looking for something else and it will be the subcommittee's job to see if we can figure out what that might look like. And I think that's a very exciting prospect. And I know that our staff and we've got consultants who will be looking at how other people across the country are doing something similar and how we might use those programs here. Um, if they're available, you know, without zoning, if, if we can use pieces of them here. And to answer Omar's question, we don't know what that's going to look like yet. But that's one of the reasons that you're on this uh, subcommittee, um, Omar, is because we need your input. Awesome. All right. Anyone else? All right, then. Subita. Yes, I'm, uh, this is Omar again. Um, yes, sir. Go ahead. I, I would just request that the city attorney weigh in on this because I know recently there was work in front of the Texas Supreme Court on upholding the historic district designation. Um, in specifically in relation to Houston's authority as a city to do stuff like this. And I have not been involved with it, though. I wish I could have been, but Kim is deeply involved in it, and she'll be the right person to advise the subcommittee on conservation districts about the limits of their authority, or possibly the lack of limits of their authority. Right. Ms. Chairman, uh, Garza, I'd maybe like to add to uh, Mr. As far as comment, because I know our government affairs uh, team for the city are also aware of potential coming legislation for the 2021 session. So I, I know Director Wallace Brown is aware of that and um, it's a good heads up for what's going on in Austin. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, thank you, Council Member. The idea here is that we want to make sure that there are lots of good ideas that are going to come up. We want to make sure that they're implementable. I don't know if that's a word. If there's a possibility of us putting them in place, I mean, great ideas are great ideas, but if, they, if we can't use them, um, that's why we're going to call on all our resources to make sure that when we move forward, we'll have something that is legal and potentially acceptable and usable and probably, uh, as I recall, uh, the possibility of uh, implementing it in a pilot area to see how it works. So um, anyone else uh, with commentary on th these items? All right, Sabita. Yes, sir. So we move on. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Sorry, is that okay? Not me, but I'll I'll mute Five, anyway. Nine, nine. Actually, that's me. Um, I'm sorry. I was just trying. Um, Commissioner Clark has just just texted me that she had been kicked off and she's trying to get back on. So I was dialing her. I just yeah. got back on. Okay, great. I appreciate it. Thank you. I apologize for that in for that intrusion. No, no, no. That that's perfectly fine. So let's see, Savita. Uh, we finished that, all that. Shall we move forward? Yes, thank you. The next um, item on the agenda is homework activities and to present these I would request uh, Lynn Hansen to come back up. Thank you, Savita. Co-chairs, members, I know that homework sounds onerous, but I promise we'll try to make it interesting. Um, to the tune of you've actually already been given some homework. We shared articles with you on concepts 
across the country and we'll continue to share that type of information with you in the future. I want to remind you if you have any questions that you'd like us to integrate with our engagement or survey, please give me or Jennifer Oslin or Savita a call or an email about that. But lastly, I want to ask you to please participate in our very first public engagement activity, and that is on letstalkhouston.org. On the screen are two snapshots from the online tool. On the right shows you what you'll see once you land on our page and scroll down. There's a row of tabs in the very first blue tab says upload a favorite pick. We're asking the public committee members, city council members, staff, anyone in Houston to upload a picture of a neighborhood that they like and to describe things about that neighborhood. Um, also, for those individuals that may have some issues with internet access, you can still participate in this activity by texting us at 833-408 two three six two you're able, you're not able to actually text us an image but you can describe a neighborhood that you love tell us where it is and tell us a few things that you like about that neighborhood thank you lynn is that um that concludes your comments yes unless there are any questions Committee members, if you have any questions. Right, committee members. Well, Savita, I can tell you that there's a beautiful Oak Line Street here in Eastwood, multiples. I'll send a picture tomorrow. Uh, so you can see how the oaks, the 100 year old oaks meet over the street. It's rather beautiful in this little East End neighborhood. So very proud of that. Thank you so much. And we encourage for you to visit our website and post it. Um, we appreciate all of the um, input and activity on the website and we want to keep the public engaged throughout the process. So uh, the next item on the agenda is um, next steps or next meeting. The next meeting is on October 20th. The meeting time will be from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. just like today. It's going to be a Tuesday and uh, during the next meeting we will cover the three other technical amendments items uh, that we um, have prepared. So um, with that, I think our presentation is concluding with this and we are ready for public comments. Right. Savita, Savita, can I ask a question first, go. please? Yes, please go ahead. On Ms. the next technical amendments, could you send that out to the committee prior to the meeting so that everyone understands, has an understanding of what we're asking them to make these quick decisions on? Sure, will do. OK, thank you. Savita, that actually goes to my question as well. So these technical amendments um, there, we don't really as this subcommittee doesn't really require a vote per se, but merely consensus. Is that correct? Yes, uh, sir, that's true. OK, so my question would be, how are we going to measure consensus? It basically is like, are we all good to go? <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Lisa, what do you think? No, I agree with you. It, um, I guess unless people are speaking up against something, we would assume we have consensus. Right. Um, so do we, Savita, do we need to ask that today after this meeting? So we've done the presentations. Do we need, let me ask this co committee, do we need times to mull over the information that you've seen? Again, I, I go back to the fact that they're basically technical. It's a language it's matter more often than not of language uh, matching. Uh, Commissioner Bryant, I see your hand up, please. Yeah, I was actually going to respond the same way. I think that this, uh, the the graphics and the support that was provided was helpful, but unless you're very familiar with these items 
or are very familiar with the context, you are kind of being caught uh, very quickly trying to make a decision. So I do agree that we probably need to get this out in, in advance and we should have a protocol in place ideally that we can measure support. Um, I think right now with 80 plus people on the line um, and no real way to measure it, it's a little tough to be able to do that appropriately. Exactly. Um, so that's one thing we'll discuss. So Subita, if you will see if we can send this out to everyone and then I'm, I'm supposing that they can get with you or Jennifer Ostlin if they have specific questions and then we can ask for consensus at the next meeting. Sure. Um, thank you so much uh, for that suggestion and I'll send out this presentation to all the committee members and it will be uploaded on the website um, right after we conclude with the meeting. And right. for the next meeting, we will provide all of the materials five days, uh, seven to five days in advance of the meeting. Great, great, great. And again, and so I think in, we need to, yeah, in oh, order to, to measure the consensus, Sunny, even though we don't vote, I do think that we need to ask for consensus or if folks that aren't in agreement. Um, well, it's not really a vote. We do need to understand, uh, you know, is it a 50 50? Do we need to go into further detail? Right. in discussion or is it 90 percent all right consensus but maybe 10 percent still need a little information it's hard to measure if we're not voting well and the fact that we can't see one another really right. hampers our ability to do that right. i wonder if we could take days you know in other words we assume that it's a yes like on this one it wouldn't be with all of them but on this one we'd assume a yes because it's mostly technical but i'm sure that there's committee members because we have a bunch of you who have more questions or who have might have in the future going forward a problem with an item that we discuss. And uh, so I think we'll behind the scenes kind of figure out what we think might work best for everyone. And uh, we'll certainly reach out to you for your input and see if you any of you have some ideas how we might do that consensus building. We want to make sure that everyone, not to say is happy with what goes forward, but is comfortable with the decision that is made and has a good understanding of why or why not. So I think that's a fair question. So. Savita will send everything to you via email and then if you would be prepared in the next meeting um, to review that as well as the new information that will be coming up um, in that meeting in October. Uh, right. And, um, what um, else? Yeah. Commissioner Bryant made a comment which is correct. We had 80 some people on the call, but the consensus is just with the committee, which is about 25, yes. 26 people. So um, right. that's what we need to figure out is how do we get that consensus amongst the committee? Exactly. Oh, Savita, one more, one more thing is we're going to public comment. Um, you remember that a guest, Stephen Payne, had a question about the title change, the title report. Do you recall that? Yes, I understand that it was a question, but I don't exactly remember the question. But right. uh, if we can request him to come back and state the question. Before that, I have um, one more thing to say, if you don't mind, please. Please. Go right ahead. Um, the, um, I request all the committee members to be part of the Livable Places Action Committee teams group that I have sent invites to. And uh, please email me if you were not able to become part of that um, group because that's where um, it will be very easy to share documents. We tried to share this presentation, but it was too big to be shared um, through email. So I request if you are on that team, we can we already have some documents there, agenda and presentation and the charter of the project. So we would require I would request all of you to be on that team's group. And um, with that, we are ready for the public comments. All right, then do we have anyone signed up for public comment? All right. And then Mr. Stephen Payne, are you still there? Yes. Oh, good. Thank you, sir, for hanging in. I appreciate it. Would you re uh, restate your question for Ms. Bandy? Well, where I'm coming from is you're going to allow the submission, assuming I even understand the process, you're going to allow the submission of this city planning letter as part of the context of getting some permission to do something in lieu of submitting a title report. And I don't know what is contemplated as being the information to be included in the city planning letter. 
And I don't know where people will get that information if they don't get a title report. Um, and I just wanted to see. I just thought it would be important that people understand that even though they don't have to submit a title report, they're probably going to end up having to get one in order to submit all the information in the planning letter. So to answer that question, uh, the title report is uh, city planning letter is also received from a title company. It is a more economical um, choice to make a title report versus a city planning letter. Um, as you can see on the screen, it has all the relevant information that the planning department would need to process an application. Um, so just to give you a glimpse of what happens in the background, the applicant who is submitting an application provides a legal description of the property to the title company. And the title company, based upon the request, can either run a title report, which is a little more expensive and probably time consuming versus a city planning letter which is generated for the platting purposes with all the relevant and pertinent information as shown on the screen and that can be that can be submitted in place of the title report right now the ordinance doesn't include the language uh, city planning letter even though we have a long standing policy to accept these documents so that's the only modification or amendment we're proposing. So this is Stephen Payne again. From what you've said and from looking more closely at my screen, which is sort of small, uh, it seems like you're going to amend the ordinance to say you can submit a city planning letter. Here's what's required to be in a city planning letter. And the planning letter may come from a title company. So someone is going to be doing that background work, just they would they do for a title report, but only for the information that is now required by the CPL instead of for full title report. Is that correct? I'm not sure if I totally followed the question. But title, just like the title report, city planning letter is produced by the title company. Well, then that that satisfies my question because it tells me where the information is going to come from. And the answer is it's going to come from a title company just like it came before. Yes, sir. Right. That's so right. alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. You're Payne. Welcome. Our next guest. Mr. Mendoza. All right, Ms. Beach, are you there? Jenny will yes, I am. I am. Thank you. Go right um, ahead. Let me get the myself on. So um, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak and for many of to many of my neighbors for joining on this meeting. Uh, my name is Jenny Beach, and I'm the current president of the Southgate Civic Club and a board member for University Place Association, which represents several neighborhoods in Central Houston. Uh, thank you for creating the Livable Places Initiative. One of the goals of this initiative is to preserve great neighborhoods, and I'm here to address that. Southgate is a pre-war neighborhood situated next to Rice University in the Medical Center. It's maintained much of its unique character, um, helping preserve a piece of Houston's history. Um, I'll also note, I find the, the conservation district's discussion interesting. Um, over the years, we've seen many changes nearby, most notably the expansion of the Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the world. And we have embraced and appreciate our TMC neighbors. And while we're pleased to be next to the medical center, we do not wish to be the medical center. Um, Southgate, along with many other area civic club organizations are requesting that the city please consider offering a height ordinance that can be adopted by Houston neighborhoods. With no zoning in Houston, deed restrictions were intended to help communities preserve their neighborhoods. And unfortunately, the time, effort, and expenses incurred by small civic clubs like mine, uh, enforcing these restrictions, uh, often facing large developers, is far too heavy a burden. Ordinances such as the minimum lot size or height restriction are ways that communities can have a say in how the neighborhood is developed. When the minimum lot size was offered by the city of Houston, Southgate went to work quickly and successfully adopting the restriction for almost the entire neighborhood. 
We residents are grateful that the Planning Commission gave Houstonians a way to preserve neighborhoods, showing a commitment to listening to residents. A height restriction ordinance would be a great tool to also give communities. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Beach. We appreciate your being here. Thanks. All right. Uh, is, I don't see anyone else in the chat. Is there anyone else? Mr. Mendoza, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Do there, I don't have any other that? speakers. Pardon me? No, no not any, anyone else. All righty. Well then, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of public comment. Um, again, I want to thank you all for being here. Lisa, Commissioner Clark, turn on your camera. I'm one. Okay. You can't see me. Okay. I can't I, see I'm, you. I would just echo your words. I appreciate everyone uh, volunteering to serve on this committee and committing your time to Houston. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. I wouldn't want to say uh, to Margaret Wallace Brown, thank you so much for everything that you and your staff have done. It's a very exciting prospect. And I, I want to make everyone understand that what we're doing here today was very well going to be what makes the face of Houston what it is in the next 20 years. There's no question that there's some things that need to be fixed, some things that are broken, some things that got broken that we didn't know about. But um, the whole idea is here, all of you, we need all of your input to make sure that Houston is livable and equitable and available for everyone. And you are gonna have a big part in making that happen. So we appreciate all of you being here. And if Dr. I might Wallace. add, if I might add for, um, for those of you that think the three items you discussed today are just um, technical and not really worth your time, let me say that we will very quickly get away from these technical amendments and get into the real meat of your work. So um, thank you for your, uh, for your time today, thank you to our chairs for ably um, chairing this meeting, and we look forward to seeing you in October. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you so you. much for being here. We appreciate all of you. Ms. Bandy, thank, thank you. you. Wonderful Thanks, job. Everyone. Thank you so much for everything. Right. Thank you. Thank thank you. Bye -bye. We'll see you in the next month. October 20th, 3 p.m. is the next meeting. Thank you all for joining us, and we really appreciate your time. All right. Thanks, guys. That concludes the Livable Places Action Committee meeting. The time is 4.53 right now. And